It is now. What happened? Okay, I'm sorry. We have to start over again. Sorry, fine. Uh, this is an interview at the at Saratoga Springs New York State Military Museum. Uh, it is November 25th, 2002, approximately 11 a.m. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth? Yes, my full name is Robert A. Fusco. Uh, my date of birth is May 28, 1922, and my place of birth is uh, right here in Saratoga Springs. Okay. Um, what was your pre-war education? My pre-war education was in the uh, city public schools right here, including Saratoga High School, which is just about two blocks east of here. Uh, I think it's now the Saratoga uh, Lake Avenue, rather, um, uh, elementary school. Okay. Could you tell me um, where you were and what you remember your feelings about the uh, hearing about Pearl Harbor? We had, uh, the family had just come back from church at, uh, from St. Clements, and um, I believe it was like 12 or 1 o'clock, well, it wasn't 1, so it must have been about 12 or so, 11.30, and at about 1 o'clock, I think, uh, we heard on the radio that there was an announcement from Washington that uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Of course, the news was a little skimpy at first, uh, and uh, I've always thought, my children have asked me the same thing, uh, particularly after the uh, World Trade Center bombing, uh, our reaction to the Pearl Harbor thing. I don't think it was myself, I don't think it was, we were quite as uh, astute or well informed in those days. So the Pearl Harbor was someplace way out in the Pacific, and I don't, it really wasn't, uh, they could have bombed Hong Kong uh, mm -hmm. maybe and uh, made as great an impression. Uh, except for, of course, a couple of days later, you know. Mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, I went to a basketball game that night um, in Convention Hall. Uh, so it didn't interfere with schedules. By the next day when we saw the headlines in the newspapers and all, then I think we fully observed uh, what had happened. Mm -hmm. um, were you drafted or did you enlist in the I service? I was drafted. I uh, tried to enlist in the, um, arm, uh, the Marines. I was, I think, 10 pounds overweight. And the, uh, I think it was in Boston, that, that office. And the uh, man in charge, the officer in charge, Nagam, uh, told me to lose 10 pounds. I said, I'm not going to cut off a leg. <laughs> so then, believe it or not, I uh, went down to the Navy in Amsterdam. And I passed everything except the, um, I think there wasn't a dentist. I don't believe there was a dentist on hand. So we had to have our, te had to have our teeth examined. So they said they would call, uh, call me uh, and let me know when the dentist was available. Other otherwise, I was all set for the Navy. I wanted to go into the CBs, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. It was a mix-up. I never got a call, and I just, I just, there's all heck. I said, I'll wait till I get inducted, which was only going to be a few months away anyway. Okay, um, could you uh, tell me then about your service uh, when you went into service um, and where you did your training, yes. your boot camp, and so on? Right. I. Um, by this time, excuse me, by this time I was going to Ohio State University and, um, because my father had insisted I go, I had planned to go to college, of course, and he insisted I go and, uh, and enroll anyway, even though I knew I was going to go into service within three or four uh, months. But he said, no, he said, you'll have a little bit of an edge if you go into the uh, service uh, coming from a college. He had served in World War I. So I went out to Ohio State and I transferred, I had my draft records or whatever they were because we had to register mm -hmm. I think at the age of 19 and I was now 20. So I had my records sent from here uh, to Columbus, Ohio um, and um, it was just about 60 years ago because I think it was uh, November, the latter part of November of 1942. It was like the 10 or 11 months after Pearl Harbor. And um, I was in a fraternity house there. I got my notice, which I expected. And I uh, went down for the physical, full physical. Uh, there was a mix-up. used to get a, a blood test 
when you first registered, which would have been here in Saratoga. But when I uh, went through the physical down in Columbus, they said they didn't have any record of the blood test. Somewhere I got crossed, mixed up from uh, between Saratoga and Columbus. So they sent me down to, um, uh, I think it was a KSC home or something. And uh, we were congregated on there for a while. I guess they didn't know what to do with it. Next thing I know, we're out on High Street, which is one of the main thoroughfares in Columbus. We're marching, about 20 of us, down to the train station. And of course, nobody will tell you anything. <laughs> So uh, we get on the train, and <laughs> I'm going uh, south. Uh, we got off in Cincinnati, and they put us on buses, and they take us across the Ohio River to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. And it's only then that I learn that because the, there was no record of my blood test, which was a simple test, uh, they had to take blood. Now, why, <laughs> why from Columbus, Ohio, uh, something about like uh, over 100 miles down to Kentucky to take a blood test, I don't know. So, of course, I didn't have anything, not even a toothbrush with me. And I went up to the PX and got some of that stuff. In the meantime, my uh, cousin who was with me out at school in the fraternity, he expected me home. Of course, that same day that I went in for my physical. After about two days, uh, he was wondering where I was, so he called home here, uh, wanting to know if I'd taken a shortcut and just come home. That was the first my parents knew that I, <laughs> I had disappeared. <laughs> so they went down to the draft board. They couldn't help. But the Red Cross fortunately located me. And uh, in those days they were giving you, a, they had been giving you a fellow's two weeks furlough before they actually had a report. They had already started reducing it. So I think I got 13 days and was told, they swore me in and was told to uh, report back to Fort Thomas uh, 13 days after. And uh, I went back, uh, they issued us our clothing, yeah, and I stayed in Fort Thomas, just small make work stuff, you know. Um, one day we were shoveling gravel or something, I don't know. Uh, it wasn't too much to do. And um, that was the first I learned that if you sleep on a cot, uh, you better make sure that you've got as much underneath you as you have on top of you to stay warm, because that cold air comes yeah. up from that canvas. Right? And um, after about two weeks, maybe, uh, we were herded onto a train. It was a large, large train, long train, and uh, traveled. Uh, I could tell it was, uh, we were going east uh, by the sun and also by the current of the Ohio River, which we were uh, going right alongside. But the conductor wouldn't tell us anything, wouldn't tell us where we were going. Uh, next I know, we uh, slowed down. And uh, I can't know how long the train ride was, but it's quite a, quite a long way. Um, and we see the ocean for the first time, the Atlantic Ocean. And we go onto this narrow peninsula, and it could have been more than, it seemed like a few hundred yards wide at this point, because you could see the ocean on both sides. At least you could see water on both sides. And anyway, it was um, uh, Fort Hancock. Which had been a, which was a coast artillery fort, mm -hmm. uh, uh, jutting out into the ocean, uh, just above uh, uh, New York Harbor. Uh, but they were going to train us there for um, uh, for our basic. So we're receiving our basic, and uh, I still, I said, "Gee, is it going to be coast artillery? Boy, this is great!" Because I knew we were near New York City then. See, but <laughs> when we arrived at the little train station. Uh, here's this army band, you guys are all in uniform, and on the bass drum it said, 113th Infantry Regimental Combat Team. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> it's not going to be the Coast Artillery. <laughs> Cut it short, the 113th was a National Guard outfit in New Jersey, and when they were federalized, if I recall correctly, uh, they, had, they were supposed to have like roughly 3,000 troops, and they were about 1,000 short. And so they needed a thousand recruits, and most of them, I think, came in on that train. So we trained, uh, I think it was one of the more unusual things. And instead of going down south in these big camps, we actually trained on this peninsula uh, up in New Jersey, and the cadre was made up of uh, officers and non-coms from the 113th. Um, we went through basic, usual three months, but in between, they picked me to go to 
called the Scout School. And uh, oh, I said, this is great, quite an honor, you know. And uh, went through pretty intensive training on night patrol and, uh, and, and compass reading and whatnot. Uh, it was only after I uh, was in a, two or three weeks that I realized that the uh, scout school meant that you would appoint me in. <laughs> um, after that, we went back to our outfit to continue our basic training. And when that three months ended, they told us fellows who had been in that school that we had to stay because we had missed a lot of the uh, basic. So we stayed another three months, about 20, maybe 25 fellows, with one officer and a couple of non-coms uh, to fill in the stuff we had missed. So I had almost had, actually, almost two full cycles of uh, infantry basic. After that, um, this would be um, maybe in uh, uh, July, perhaps. No, no, uh, uh, more like April. April, they um, assigned me to uh, Riverhead, Long Island. That's what, excuse me, for the unit of the 113th. And the 113th was patrolling the beaches along with the Coast Guard. Uh, this was shortly after those Germans had landed in, the, oh, yeah. uh, in New Jersey, and I believe down in Carolinas or someplace. And uh, my job then, because I, I had done some newspaper work and I, I knew how to type, uh, they put me on the uh, teletype. Uh, there wasn't anything more sophisticated than a teletype in those days. And uh, I, worked, I always volunteered to work at night because that's when you saw a few fewer officers and, and non-coms at night. And uh, these fellows would call in from stations out on the beach and report nothing doing at all. And I don't know, maybe there were four or five stations. I believe they called in every hour. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would type out the nothing doing sort of. Mm -hmm. And it went to um, FBI headquarters in Brooklyn. So uh, I was there, but it was terribly boring. Uh, then notes come up or on bulletin board that the Army was uh, opening the Army Specialized Training Program. Uh, in our case, they were looking for fellows to excuse me, take this program. Um, it was basically a condensed, uh, hurry up uh, college schedule of training uh, for engineers. And uh, supposedly, uh, you would be commissioned after two years, uh, but you had to stay in the Army uh, a fixed length of time, I, I don't remember now what it was, uh, after the war, or at least be prepared. So uh, I took the test, passed it, and uh, was assigned to uh, CCNY in New York City, uh, which was a, a great college in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great college. And uh, I was in the, what they call the upper uh, campus, Amsterdam Avenue, and I believe Convent Avenue, around 132nd Street. And we lived in a, um, what had, I think had been a Jewish orphanage across the street from the uh, campus. <laughs> One of the funny things is that some of the bathrooms had uh, short toilets, <laughs> short bowls. <laughs> These fellows bending way over in the morning <laughs> to wash their faces and shave. Um, I went there maybe uh, until January, this would be now uh, 44. Um, one funny incident happened there. I was taking, it was in physics, in a physics class, <clears throat> and we're, we're learning something about atoms and that stuff. Well, I, of course, had taken one course in Saratoga and in the high school about on that. Uh, this was a slightly, slightly more advanced course. And um, this fellow, I don't know if he was an assistant prof, uh, I think he was something more than an instructor. And he's telling us this one day about the tremendous energy that could be released from an atom or collective atoms. Mm -hmm. And he held up a blackboard eraser and he said, um, did any of you, are, are any of you familiar with the Manhattan Project? We didn't know what he was talking about. I guess he assumed because we were in uniform, we knew what was going on. So, and we just looked at each other. He says, can you imagine, he said, 
what you would get in the way of an explosion if they found a way of releasing these atoms from this blackboard eraser all at once. Now, I don't know if you would weigh off base on that particular thing or not. Uh, that's all I remember, but it stuck with me all this time. Here's a, the, even today they call it the super secret mm -hmm. um, atomic energy program, Manhattan Project. And uh, here it was in, uh, I say, uh, almost two years before they actually exploded the bomb and then the public became aware of it. And he's talking about it in uh, class. A lot of CCNY faculty uh, were involved one way or another in the project, so they were familiar with that. Uh, I was transferred at some point um, in um, late winter uh, for the convenience of the Army uh, down to um, Randolph-Macon College in uh, Ashland, uh, Virginia. Now Ashland uh, is or was the site of one of the last shootings by these snipers. A fellow was coming out of a, it was a store or a uh, fast food restaurant, I believe in Ashland, uh, Virginia, uh, which has nothing to do with my, uh, mm -hmm. my career. But uh, uh, we were there for only briefly, maybe a couple of months. By this time, they decide they need troops um, for the invasion. I had a cousin who was in the um, um, Air Force, Air Corps training uh, to be a pilot. And all those guys were pulled out you know, one day they're trained to be a pilot, and the next day they're going into an infantry outfit as privates. Uh, I had the two rounds of infantry basics, served briefly in an infantry outfit, and naturally the Army sends me to the engineers. Uh, so we were sent down, a bunch of us, to uh, uh, Virginia again. And um, in Virginia, we um, uh, formed the 731st Engineer Depot Company. The fellows who came in as cadre, some came in from specialized training programs, uh, others I don't know where. But there were, we had, and along with what we just called the ASTP fellows, uh, we had so many non-coms, we had probably, uh, I'd say, somewhat more non-coms than we had privates in this company at this time. So the, the hope of getting some kind of promotion was, was pretty big, pretty, pretty hopeless. Uh, we trained there. Uh, we went up at some point, upper New Jersey, for some training uh, the depot company. It turned out later we were just heavy equipment company, or uh, providing the equipment. And uh, that was my first experience, although I'd seen a lot of German POWs back at the camp. Uh, it was a um, camp picket. Um, up in New Jersey, up northern New Jersey, uh, we were at this uh, engineer depot. Uh, and it was my first experience seeing Italian prisoners. By this time, Italy had um, become an associate power. They had strung up Mussolini and they had a new government. And, uh, and um, instead of a the patch over here said, uh, I think it said associate power rather than allies or something that some of the foreign troops used to wear in the United States. Uh, they wore American GI uniforms. They were probably, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 of the guys. Uh, although I have a, an Italian heritage. I couldn't speak a word of Italian, um, but uh, some of these fellows could, could speak a smattering of, uh, of English. And uh, I used to talk with them once in a while, kind of interested in where they were picked up. And uh, almost to a man, they had been uh, captured over in North Africa in the desert fighting over there. And they were sent back to the United States up to uh, Pine Camp, up in uh, Camp Drum up in, mm -hmm. near Watertown in the middle of winter. <laughs> this is called a Pina Camp. And they were convinced that they were sent up there as punishment <laughs> from the hot sands of uh, Africa to the uh, cold climate of uh, northern New York State. My only other, uh, I should say my only other, but one of the things I recall about uh, being at, uh, at this place for about a month or five, six weeks. 
uh, the fellow in charge, the officer in charge of the POW, although we didn't call him POW then, uh, he was a, uh, an Italian army colonel. And uh, I describe him as coming at straight out of central casting uh, as a, a buffoon. Uh, he walked around in um, jod purrs uh, with the uh, leather leggings and he had a little stick, you know, and he was natty. And he's screaming at this private one day. And I asked this fellow what he was complaining about. He was complaining, <coughs> excuse me, he was complaining that his uniform hadn't been properly ironed. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> anyway, from there we went down to uh, North Carolina to uh, finish off our training. And, um, and then prepare to go overseas. By this time, D-Day had happened. Now, uh, I just wanted to interject that uh, my career did not include any uh, heroic actions or anything like that. But uh, as you know, they used to say, and I think they still say that it takes 10 men to uh, get behind uh, mm -hmm. one man up on the front. Uh, so um, I never apologized. I, I admire those fellows who uh, were up there. Uh, the ones who survived and particularly the ones who were killed. Uh, but uh, I don't apologize uh, any time. I don't feel uh, ashamed uh, being a, in somewhat of a service group. We were in the campaigns, uh, campaign, the Battle of uh, uh, Central Europe and the Battle of the Rhineland. And later when I went over to the Pacific, uh, we were uh, given a ribbon for the uh, liberation of the Philippines. So uh, I think whatever the army wanted us to do, we did, mm -hmm. and I think we did a good job. Uh, anyway, we prepared to go to um, Europe. Uh, the one funny thing I remember there, in, in North Carolina, uh, we were having gas training. <coughs> Excuse me, gas drill, and just one day it was punishment. We were getting punishment from this one, the, our company commander, who was. Uh, as probably a lot of company commanders would uh, rightly or wrongly thoroughly dislike most of them. And um, had a nickname, but I can't believe what it was for. Uh, so they had a, a USO show uh, right across the road from where our barracks were. I think we occupied two barracks, two buildings. And right across the road was a big, typical USO auditorium. And, um, and there was also an outdoor stadium type um, with a stage uh, location. This day there was an orchestra. It was a name orchestra, but I don't remember what it was. And uh, of course the amphitheater uh, was loaded with people. Uh, this, whatever we had done or not done, the company commander decided we can't go to the show. And in addition, we're going to go through gas drill. So our gas officer, he was a first lieutenant, uh, takes us out, and there was a lot of scrub pine in the camp, uh, takes us across the road, and we're going through this gas drill, which we had done several times. Uh, Non-coms would go up ahead of us and set off these pots or whatever they were, of uh, like a tear gas type stuff. And uh, as we approach someone, you would yell gas, and you'd pull the thing out, and you'd put it around, and you go through this fog or smoke, whatever you want to call it, and Got clear. They all clear. And then you were supposed to test, take a little <laughs> sniff, you know. And if you're satisfied, then you could take the mask off. But you do this maybe three or four or five times, uh, going. Then we turn around and we come back. Now all the while, this is in back of that stage in the amphitheater. <laughs> Just as we get behind the amphitheater, behind the stage, the wind shifted. They had released some gas, and the wind carried it into the amphitheater. And it curled around on the stage and along all those seats. <laughs> well, we just stood there roaring. <laughs> and of course, it broke up the show. <laughs> the gas officer took off across the road with the first <laughs> lieutenant. They said. And uh, we went over. We weren't in any hurry because we knew it wasn't our responsibility. And we're standing there laughing. And the lieutenant jumped into a jeep. And he said, if anyone's looking for me, don't tell them where I went. So he roars down the road, and this major comes over, and he was purple. 
He was purple in the face. He wants to know who the gas officer is. Of course, everybody volunteered his name right away. See, <laughs> where did he go? Right that way, sir. Down the road. He took off after. Him. I never heard any uh, what the uh, repercussions were. Um, anyway, we got ready and uh, we went uh, to uh, let's see Camp Miles Standish, which I, I'd never heard of, which was near uh, Boston. That's where we were put on ship to go to Europe. And the ship was the SS Argentina. Mm. Then a, uh, a cruise liner uh, before the war. Uh, and after the war, it attained some, I shouldn't say notoriety, but uh, um, publicity or whatever, because it was, I think, the first, or one of the first ships utilized uh, to bring war brides from Europe back to the United States. That's a great honor, I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> um, I've seen, I saw pictures in the paper of, of the Argentina. I'm sure now it's a scrap, uh, probably in, the, in many places now. Mm -hmm. uh, we landed in uh, France, uh, stayed for a while. At when a, did you reach France? Ah, uh, let's see. About the time of the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I remember that is because going over the ship, the Argentina, was packed. It wasn't the biggest ship in the world, but it uh, carried, I think, like 7,000 troops. So it was really jammed uh, to the extent that they could only feed us twice a day. And uh, you have breakfast like uh, nine or ten o'clock in the morning, and then you fed your, your dinner at like four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, <laughs> I actually saw two men fighting over a candy bar. <laughs> had a terrible fight. So uh, we landed uh, in France, uh, went up to a place called Lucky Strike, which uh, received a lot of uh, um, men from the states. Uh, and we stayed at Lucky Strike for maybe two or three weeks. Uh, all I remember there, I shouldn't say all, but the things I remember mostly about Lucky Strike was that we continued on two meals a day. I believe it was probably a logistics thing at that time that uh, because of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, everything had uh, gotten uh, lost up and uh, <clears throat> we were limited to, uh, to supplies provided. But of course, there was no hardship really. Mm -hmm. The worst hardship was the mud. It was that sucking mud that would, you wore those Arctic boots, you know. And it would take you 10 minutes to walk the equivalent of maybe a, a half a block. It was, it was almost agony to get to the mess kitchen or whatever they called it. Yeah. Um, from there, we um, uh, got on those, um, um, what do they call them, uh, uh, 40 and 8s. The, uh, they seem to be all over Europe, the uh, French boxcars. Mm -hmm. um, we eventually got to a, a location uh, which was like a motor pool and that's where we picked up all our equipment which consisted of the usual engineer stuff um, including uh, some cranes, large bulldozers uh, and uh, trucks and down the jeeps. Um, fortunately we had to go, by this time we're, we're on our own now, driving and we had to go through Paris. So however they worked it, we got about three days in Paris. Uh, we looked so unkempt coming from uh, Lucky Strike. Facilities weren't the greatest there. Uh, the people in, in Paris, GI, other GIs, thought we had just come back from the front. And we thought, no, 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 we didn't come from the front. Yeah, well, you guys look, well, that's just the way we look. You know? um, so uh, I just spent, like I say, about three days in, in, in Paris. Then we got back in our vehicles and we went to, um, up to uh, Toul. Uh, it's an old walled city, T-O-U-L, um, not too far from Nancy, which played a big role in, uh, was the site of a lot of action in uh, World War I and uh -huh. later in, uh, in World War II. Uh, Tool was also the location in World War I for the American Air Squadron. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker and some of them, there was apparently an airfield. 
Um, our job, uh, just outside of Tool, there was a railroad ran from, I think they said it was from Marseille, uh, and sort of took a bend uh, around Tool and went directly to Paris. Um, and of course there were, the train ran the other way, uh, from, from the coast, La Havre and all. Uh, and when they got to our uh, junction, uh, the train would go on, uh, but it would drop off three, four, five flatbeds usually, or gondolas, you know, like coal cars. And they were loaded with this, <coughs> it was mostly bridge cro uh, crossing equipment, pontoon boats, large timbers, a lot of rope, explosives. Uh, those were the main uh, 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 items that we stored. And uh, these trucks would come in from the front and pick up the stuff uh, to carry back up for, oh, Bailey Bridges, that's the uh, British uh, invention, something like a uh, erector set operation where the bridge, part of it is already constructed and then they put it together with these large pins and use sledgehammers to, to tie it all in. You know, it was quite a, quite a thing. Um, we had some German POWs helping us along with, um, along with uh, the usual people uh, just, just these homeless people, uh, French, uh, Polish, uh, and whatever, and they would be paid uh, so much a day. Uh, we had some Russians come in, and uh, we used them as guards up in the guard towers. Uh, they added a comedy to it, uh, the whole thing, because, uh, well, it was comedy to us, but uh, this, this one kid, about my age, 21 or so. Uh, Georgi, his name was, George. Uh, and uh, we communicated in German. I, I could speak fair German those days. And uh, you know, he, he'd fall asleep up in, the, up in the guard tower, and his non com would come around, make a patrol every hour or so, and he started yelling for him. And Georgi wouldn't respond, this guy's throwing sticks up at him, <laughs> and stones. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, we were there for uh, you know, several weeks, a number of weeks. Uh, from there, just about the time the war ended, we crossed the Rhine and uh, went to uh, Mannheim. The Mannheim later, of course, was the city where um, General Patton had the accident yeah. and he eventually died. And it's not too far from Heidelberg. Got into Heidelberg a couple of times. And that was my first experience with their riding on the uh, on the Autobahn between uh, Mannheim and Heidelberg. Uh, back in Mannheim we were in actually in a suburb called Rheinau. And um, uh, two buildings had uh, like six apartments and uh, enough for our company. Uh, what we were doing was uh, throwing um, this so is where the cranes came in at. Came in handy. Throwing, uh, emptying any kind of a car, mostly they were German, of course, trains, and emptying the cars. And again, most of them were gondolas. Uh, and just tossing the stuff into the, uh, into the uh, Rhine. Uh, they wanted these empty cars for bringing in uh, supplies for the Army of Occupation. And uh, this one day, uh, I'm sitting on the steps. I had uh, been. Um, assigned to quarters for about two weeks. I used to be, have terrible allergy in those days. And it was about mowing season, I believe, over there in Germany. And uh, I actually couldn't see half the time. I rubbed my eyes and they get all wrinkled. So the doctor told me to stay indoors for about two weeks. You can't stay indoors for two weeks. So I, I used occasionally go outside. Um, and this weapons carrier pulls up one day. I, the bigger part, it was a Jeep. The jeep pulls up and the fellow wants a weapons carrier. He just asked me where they were. Um, and I said, what's the problem? He said, no problem. He said, uh, one of the Polish workers, he said, was hooking up stuff, material, uh, in this gondola onto a crane and dump it in the river. He said he came across these large boxes, wooden boxes. And he opened one up and he came up with a bottle. And the American operating the crane said, throw it away. Oh, we got in there. Russia, the police folks said, no, no. Anyway, it was champagne. There were four, uh, four dozen bottles 
to a crate. It's 48 bottles. And I think there are either 10 or 11 crates. So something over 500 bottles of champagne. So they gave one crate to the workers and took the other 10 crates back to the company. The company was 200 men. <laughs> so I said, oh boy, so much work to do. <laughs> I did say it then, but later. <laughs> and so little time in which to do it, aping uh, 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 Winston Churchill. And we had one raw office even that, that night. Um, so um, from there, let's see. We, uh, well, not from there. There, uh, shortly after, thereafter, uh, General Eisenhower uh, lifted uh, censorship of uh, all mail. So we were able to write home and just, uh, tell about everything we had done or been exposed to or whatever. That censorship was off, off only about three days, and they called us out one day and said the censorship was put back on for our company. Well, right away we knew what that meant. We were going to go to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <coughs> again, like, the, like scout school, I consider this quite an honor. <laughs> So uh, we sent to Marseille. By this time, I'm driving the CO's Jeep. And uh, I think it took us like an overnight uh, to uh, go down to Marseille. Uh, we got down there in a, a pretty rough city. And we're on this plateau high above the city. Uh, it was hot, hotter than the devil. And uh, very little water. They had enough water to drink. And, uh, but, uh, as far as showers or laundry, uh, forget it. I think we probably got a shower a week. Or well, we were there about maybe two weeks. Uh, and I remember this fellow coming in one day, some officer, showing us how to freshen our shirts, even without water. They called it dry, wa dry laundry. <laughs> and you, what you do, it, you, know, you crush it, and you do this to it or something, then you hang it on a line. When it got all through, it smelled just like an old dirty <laughs> shirt. <laughs> but uh, uh, we went into Marseille. You had to get a uh, usual pass to go into Marseille, uh, which was quite a fun town, of course, but you had to stay out of trouble. Uh, I saw some patches the first time I was in there, shoulder patch, and I recognized it as the infantry unit uh, to which my cousin belonged. That's the fellow who was out at Ohio State with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew it was a unit. And they asked me around, and they told me that where he was. It was on this road uh, going toward uh, Spain. Um, of course, it was still in France. Uh, so this one day, I got up there, and you weren't supposed to. I got a pass from Marseille, but I, I went the opposite direction. And uh, went to... Uh, Hitchhiked, I forgot the name of the city, to, uh, near where his unit was, and uh, hitchhiked again. I mean, hopped a ride again on a, on a truck. Got down to his office, and he was shaving, and I walked in on him. Of course, he was quite surprised. And they were just getting ready to go into Marseille, his company. So I said, yeah, I'll go back with you. So at some point, there was a checkpoint. And of course, I had nothing but a pass to go to Marseille, and I was a different unit. So they hid me under the bench where the fellows were sitting. And it wasn't too hard. Uh, nobody saw me. We got in Marseille and um, had a good time, including our first steak dinner quite a while. And it was only afterwards that we learned that this restaurant served horse steak. <laughs> it, it wasn't bad, except a little, little tough, a little chewy. Uh, but, uh, well, that's, that's, I saw my cousin a couple times after that. They were there then, this infantry division, or at least units of it. Uh, to process, help process troops who were going to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were promised, excuse me. Sure. Tend to talk too fast. <laughs> they were promised, uh, or told, that uh, as soon as, well, I don't know what the time element was, but several weeks were up, that they would then be uh, shipped back to the States. So, uh, of course, we had our mail was being censored again, but his mail wasn't. So I told him, I said, well, uh, I think we learned now, it's last time I saw him, that, that we were going to ship out like in two days. Because at that point, they tell you, no more passes, nothing, you got to have to stay right around the company. 
because when you, you get the award, you get it. Got to be ready to go. So I told him, uh, I said, when you write, I said, send a letter to my mother and father and tell them that I'm okay, not to worry, uh, the war will be over quick over in Japan, et cetera, et cetera. And we, which he did. And uh, I said, uh, when you get back to Saratoga, have a drink ready for me for, for when I get back. Uh, anyway, we got in the ship. It was uh, one of those uh, attack transports, Navy, uh, uh, the General, USS General Sturgis. Uh, it was, a, as they say, a Navy ship. It was uh, armed with, um, like, I think, five-inch guns, a couple of them. And uh, we went um, through, across the Atlantic, uh, in, through the Panama Canal, which was interesting. And we came off the other side, on the Pacific side. We were only out for about a day or so uh, when we learned that the city of Hiroshima had been bombed with this atomic bomb. Uh, the favorite word for the press in those days was atomized. The city had been atomized. And it took me about a day and I said, I recall, I said, oh, that's what that guy was talking about back in CCNY when he wanted to know if uh, uh, we had heard of the Manhattan Project. Uh, I didn't know whether they used a blackboard eraser or not, but <laughs> apparently it worked. What was your reaction when you heard this? One of my reactions, uh, I remember sitting on the deck, not sounding like a sailor, with I back up against the bulkhead, <laughs> and talking to a buddy, and they said the city had been wiped out. And I says, well, considering all the lousy places that we've been in, I says, I'll bet we get assigned to Hiroshima. Uh, well, of course, we were happy that it looked, it looked like mm -hmm. this was going to end, but it, they hung on for another six days. Oh, uh, the other thing was everybody started cheering because they figured the vessel was just going to make a sharp right-hand mm -hmm. turn and go up to San Francisco or someplace. You know? And the captain of the ship came on board and uh, came on the speaker and said, contrary to your wishes, <laughs> etc., we're continuing <laughs> our original um, uh, route and destination. Uh, we got down to New Guinea, Hollandia, New Guinea, and uh, I saw these fireworks. Uh, they were shooting rockets on the sky and all. And the Japanese had surrundered. I believe that was August 12th, something around that. And that was after they dropped the second bomb. Uh, surely they're going to send it home now. But no, uh, we were going up to the Philippines. And we got to Manila, uh, which was quite a thing, uh, the Manila Harbor. Uh, you can see all these. They did a brutal job on it, bombing. Uh, the harbor and all these ships, you know, the mass sticking up with their smokestacks and all, and the ship had to sort of zigzag its way through. In fact, we got off on the on the nets uh, into into smaller boats because the ship could only get so close to the uh, to the mainland. There were no no docks left. Uh, we got into Manila, walked through part of the city, and then and got on these box cars again. Uh, and uh, took us maybe a day. We got up into northern Luzon, uh, up at the uh, Lingayen Gulf, uh, which is where the invasion of the uh, Philippines, of northern Philippines, just started. Um, we were there maybe three, w three or four weeks, and it was sort of an idyllic thing. The war was over. Uh, uh, walked around with our shoes and undershorts almost all the time. <laughs> Uh, went down to the beach and lolled around down there. You know. I got so brown that I think the tan lasted about two years after I got <laughs> home. Uh, went into town a couple of times. Uh, my buddy and I one time went up this jungle road. We had met this Dutch missionary priest uh, down where we were. And he said he had this church in this village. He described, he told us how to get there. So uh, we took the main road, bumped a ride from the truck, we got up to the main road where the intersection was, and he says, straight ahead that way. And we had to walk the eight miles, uh, during which we uh, went through this battlefield. Uh, it was a battle of Belidi Pass. I think there was something like 20,000 Japanese were killed in there. And it was the most steep battlefield I could imagine. It was like this. And uh, there were what was left, you know, skeletons all over the place. The Americans, of course, they grabbed their own men. 
you know, the unfortunate ones who were killed and buried them. Uh, but the Japanese were left there. And all you saw were, were the bones and helmets. Uh, the equipment had been picked up, I'm sure, by the uh, natives, uh, the Filipinos. And later I asked uh, someone who said he was there at the battle, I said, well, how did you manage to get supplies to these fellows? You could barely walk up this thing. And he said, we, we use weapons carriers. We tried to get them one hot meal a day up near the front. And the way they did it, they, the truck would go as far as it could. And then somebody would grab the winch uh, cable uh, on the front bumper. All these trucks had winches. And, and go up as far as, extend the, the cable as far as you could and put it around a, a tree, hook it on. And then they would winch the truck up. Uh, uh -huh. the, and then somebody would get out and put a couple of blocks of stone, put a couple of stones or a couple of blocks of wood under. Then they'd grab the winch cable and you go up again. So they sort of winched the way up. Uh, we got up to the uh, where the uh, priest was. Uh, he had an old, <coughs> excuse me, church built by the Spanish in the 1700s. The roof had been blown off, but the walls must have been three feet thick. They were made out of homemade red brick. You know, it was quite interesting. Uh, back down in um, Lingayen, well, um, finally told we were going to go to uh, into Japan. And uh, we got an LST. It was a Coast Guard LST. Uh, we put all our heavy equipment on. I didn't think that the ship could take all this equipment. Could you? Some of our, our bulldozers, they were called what, D8s, I guess. They were enormous. And to say nothing of the cranes and um, some uh, road equipment. Uh, but we got it all on in the hold. And we slept up in the quarters. But I learned the first night. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like a double hull, so that I swear. Well, maybe this is why there's a narrow bunk, canvas bunk on each side, and you got about 18 inches. That's the aisle, uh, claustrophobic, uh, and it was very hot. So after the first day, I said, "Heck with it." So uh, I was driving a weapons carrier at that time. So uh, I went up to my weapons carrier. They were they were uh, cabled. They were buckled down on the deck. So I managed to get a cot from someplace. So I slept, uh, it took us two weeks. I slept in a cot up on the deck uh, for the rest of the trip, and that was much more pleasant. Uh, we got into Kuri, I think, sometime, well, yeah, or sometime in September. And um, with the LST, and uh, unloaded, and uh, went down to Kuri uh, Naval Base. I didn't fully appreciate what this was at the time. All I thought was a naval headquarters. It was more than that. It was a huge uh, naval base shipbuilding uh, yard. Uh, later I learned about some of the larger battleships uh, and carriers were built in Kuri. Across the road from where, where I was stationed, from where I was living, uh, were these uh, midget submarines, two man subs. And they were stacked up like cordwood. There'd be a bunch of them, and then they were just too high. And then between to be another bunch of uh, and the, out in the harbor was a uh, an I class uh, Japanese sub it was all black and it had a, uh, a hangar on the deck and in the hangar was a small plane seaplane with folded wings and a small crane and they'd open up the hangar lift up the ship the, the, the plane and place it down in the water. And it was to make a trip, of course it would be a suicide trip, naturally, uh, to bomb an American city. They had several of these. Of course, they were never deployed. But there was still a part of the crew and the captain on board the ship. And he said that uh, he was told to stay there until he got his orders. So they were, they were just living on a ship out in, the, out in the middle of the harbor. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> it wasn't the day we were there we found out that I was almost, almost correct when I prophecy that we'd be stationed in uh, Hiroshima. We were like 12 miles from Hiroshima on the coast and uh, you had to get a pass in those days. So within a week some of us got passes uh, to go into Hiroshima which was probably the, uh, the most uh, impressive uh, maybe thing that I saw in the whole war. Uh, you approach the city and um, everything looked normal. Uh, and then you may, maybe take a turn, and now the, the buildings, the two-story buildings, are all slanted. 
like away from the center of the city. Then you take another turn, and all of a sudden there's nothing but this vast plain of, uh, of rubble. And off in the distance you might see a couple of concrete buildings, you know, seven, eight stories high, including that one that's still standing as part of the Peace Park, has the rounded top, uh, looks like an observatory, but I believe it was part of a, some kind of a commercial, almost like a chamber of commerce type thing, and uh, they've preserved that building. I remember walking up to that cluster of four or five buildings and looking inside, there was nothing inside. It all been collapsed, but the walls are still standing. Uh, the things that impressed me most were that, despite uh, everything being blown down, just about every building, except a handful of these masonry buildings, um, round smokestacks. Uh, so many of them were untouched. I don't know why. And uh, they had some steel poles along this one major road or street. Uh, that went up and went out and uh, trolley cars, they used trolley cars and they carried the wires. And um, of course they weren't running on, <laughs> but uh, in this one section, these poles went up about 12 feet and then they were bent, like a 90 degree angle. And you went several blocks and just like some giant had come along and bent these things all to the same degree uh, and then into the same direction. Uh, which was weird. Back in uh, Puri, I spoke with a woman. I, I, again, I don't know how we communicated, but uh, you, you can manage. And uh, asked her everything. Of course, she was around at the blast, and she said, "Yeah, that's just 12 miles away." And she said, uh, "What they heard was a, uh, or what they saw first was this ball of lightning or whatever light off in the distance." And uh, then they um, heard this noise, it was a number of seconds later, this noise, and she pointed to some, they're like poplar trees, uh, very high, and she described how they were bent way over, they, they snapped back after, but bent way over by the wind blast or the, the, that followed the, uh, the explosion. Uh, Corey wasn't too bad, but the harbor was a mess. Uh, later doing some research for genealogy back here in the United States. Uh, in fact, it was at the Saratoga Library. I was checking uh, Saratogians uh, for about that time when they dropped the bomb. And in um, several weeks, a couple of weeks before they dropped the bomb, the U.S. Navy had sent wave after wave of, sh of ships, of uh, planes, into this part of uh, Japan, including Kuri. And the, the, this, the uh, story, including Kuri in the headlines of the Saratogian, uh, described how they had, uh, I think they had three successive days, had bombed uh, the ships and the, uh, and the dry docks and whatever in Kuri. Uh, I, our job in, in Kuri was to um, supervise the unloading of, uh, of transports uh, with the material, material that we would be required by the Army of Occupation. And since all the docks were all destroyed, uh, the ships had to be unloaded out in the harbor. And uh, the Army employed uh, the Japanese who had those sampans. I don't know if that's the Chinese or Japanese word. But anyway, the family-owned uh, ships, boats. Uh, there'd be a husband and wife and several children on them. And they got like, I don't know, 25 cents a trip or something. Uh, they'd go out, load up, come back, and then the cranes, they had these huge cargo nets, so the cranes would pick them up and put them into a truck, an army truck, and then the truck would come up to where we were. And the army always has these colors, I've forgotten them now, but red was engineers, I think yellow was, uh, was uh, supply or something. Uh, and you could tell by the paint on the side where this thing was to go. Uh, I was there until, uh, well, through Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, and between Christmas and New Year, uh, posted on the bulletin board was a notice that uh, I was leaving and uh, got on a Japanese tr a train, maybe like, I don't know, a day or two before New Year's, and uh, went to um, Nagoya, I think it was, uh, 
uh, stayed there. <laughs> we got there and we thought we were going to ship out right away, but our old broken down old merchant vessel uh, had a broken screw. So it took us uh, several days, but of course, and we couldn't go anywhere. I think we could go to the theater. But that was all. We'd go from our barracks to the theater because they didn't know at what moment we'd be called to get on the ship. It was the worst boat I was ever on in my life. <laughs> But uh, I was happy to move. So we went into Washington, uh, unloaded in the state of Washington, and then took a two or three day trip across the country uh, on a train, went down to Fort Dix, was discharged, and um, the whoever was in charge of it uh, thought that Saratoga was a suburb of Buffalo. <laughs> so the Army used to pay you. I don't know how they heard to figure it out but by the mile or something, uh, give you uh, some money. So I was paid uh, to return to uh, Buffalo rather than, <laughs> rather than Saratoga, and I didn't even complain about it. Uh, so that was in, uh, in uh, January of 46. But the w one last thing, uh, I got home, and uh, of course some of my friends were already there, and it was a great time for the next two or three months. And the first thing I got home, I says, where's Al? That was my cousin in uh, He was still in France. <laughs> We'd gone halfway around the world, and it was what, six, about five or six months later, and he was still there in France. He did get home about a month later after that, but uh, I, I beat him home. <laughs> now, after that, uh, we, um, as I said, we had a grand time. It was a free... Uh, you were unloading, you know, uh, uh, everything in your feelings and all. And uh, was, every night was a party, so I, uh, here in Saratoga. Yeah. Did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yes, I did, certainly. Um, it, you know, they also had that 5220 club. Yes. Uh, where you got $20 a week for, uh, for a year. Could you explain that a little bit, please? Uh, well, what do you know club? about it? Did you ever use that? Yeah, I used it for about. Uh, six, seven weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what you got was, uh, if you weren't working, uh, you'd go down to the VA office, which was in the arcade building on Broadway. And um, if you got your check right there or what? I guess you, maybe you just registered, assure them that you weren't. Five minutes. Assure them that you weren't working. Mm -hmm. and, and you got $20. Uh, it was supposed to last for a year, but you no. Know, <laughs> Even free money isn't going to be, it's going to be boring after. So after about six, seven weeks, uh, I got myself a job uh, up at uh, Phasic Tipton, mm -hmm. the sales paddock in Saratoga, uh, up at the racetrack. Uh, they, of course, had, along with the track, were closed during the war. And uh, now Phasic Tipton wants to uh, make sure they're in uh, ship shape for the coming season because they want to do the usual period of one, one week of auctioning. Mm -hmm. So they had to paint all the stables, put on new roofing. And uh, so I got a job up there. We got a dollar an hour. We worked nine hours a day, uh, six days a week. So it wasn't a lot of big money. I think I yeah, got like something like $54 a week uh, at a dollar an hour. But I preferred that, uh, I could say $20 a week. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and we still had plenty of time to go out at night and have fun. Uh, then GI Bill, yeah, I uh, went back and I decided to go back to Ohio State. Mm -hmm. uh, Three minutes. Okay, uh, Ohio State, of course, uh -huh. have to time this thing. Uh, it's now going to be in the championship uh, bowl for, um, yep. for the year. And I uh, went back to Ohio State and uh, completed my, uh, my uh, studies there. Uh, my last year back home, uh, I met my wife, although I had known her, and didn't know at the time, but uh, she became my wife, and uh, Betty, Betty Ford, and uh, we went back to Sarah, to uh, Columbus uh, for my senior year, and uh, then we came home to Saratoga. Uh, by this time, it's like September of uh, 40, uh, 49. Yeah, September 49. Did you uh, belong to any, uh, do you, or did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, no, I didn't. You know, I, I've never been much of a joiner. And uh, I joined the Boy Scouts. Two minutes. I joined the Boy Scouts, and I uh, 
stayed with them about a year or so. Uh, I guess uh, one of these fellows that uh, uh, I would do whatever I was required to do, and uh, I never caused anybody, I don't think, uh, too much trouble. But uh, I didn't like a lot of uh, order. I, mm -hmm. I guess a little bit more of a free spirit. So uh, I did not, although, you know, I, I got to admit that they've done great jobs, the American Legion, particularly mm -hmm. in the and the VFW, uh, I should have uh, done it. I should have joined, but uh, like I said, I didn't look forward to going down to meetings and usual stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview.